I truly believe that we need to fundamentally rethink how we provide access to home ownership. This, that is the past. The future and the fix is going to look quite a bit different. I want to get started by just talking about home ownership. Um, my dad immigrated to the U.S. in the late 1970s, and when him and my mom decided to settle down and and actually form a family, they they tried to purchase a home. And when they went out to get a mortgage, they were actually denied. My parents fortunately were able to get seller financing, and that house became the house we grew up in. You see, to my family, home ownership was everything. It was our only form of savings. My only Our only investment vehicle, and the way that we built up wealth. Home ownership is so core to the American dream, and it represents safety, security, family. However, increasingly, home ownership is becoming difficult to achieve for many Americans. My name is Adina Hafitz. I'm the CEO of Divi Homes, and today I'm going to talk to you about how home ownership is evolving. So let's dive in. What's the definition of home ownership? Well, it used to be pretty clear, right? You own title to the property. You generally put in a pretty significant size of, of equity into the home, and maybe you had a mortgage with a first lien position on the asset. Well, the definition of how we own and ultimately utilize assets seems to be changing across a number of other industries. We first saw this with Uber and Lyft, who redefined what it meant to own a car or how we interact with a car. The utility of a car is ultimately to get you from point A to point B, and if someone could provide this utility in a cheaper and easier manner, well, maybe you didn't need to own a car anymore. Same thing with Airbnb. Why own a beautiful vacation home when you can Airbnb it instead? There is a new guard for how consumers are thinking about large-dollar fixed asset investments, which is they are solving for use, experience, and ultimately access. Why own an asset when you can access it? It doesn't seem surprising that we're seeing threads of this enter into how we think about home ownership. We've gone from historically having one option on how we can purchase a home—you bought it with a mortgage—to now having a number of other options. I call these companies on the right the new guard of home ownership, and they're fundamentally rethinking how we access a home. The nuance here is that they're going from just being able to provide what Uber and Lyft did, which is use, experience, and access, and they're adding on a fourth dimension. And that fourth dimension is a return on your financial investment. So not only are you going to use it, experience it, access it, but you're going to solve for some financial return as well. And as you can see from this chart of VC investment in real estate tech, we seem to be at the start of a wave. That is going to fundamentally change the way consumers purchase and ultimately own a home. So let's go back to a bit of history to help define the problem. So this is the the rate of U.S. home ownership, and what you can see is that it was you know roughly mid 40s up until about 1934 when when FHA was created. So FHA is the Federal Housing Administration. It was formed in 1934 post Great Depression. Government wanted to be able to extend more credit, and so the FHA created the fixed 30-year mortgage, and they really lowered down payment requirements. This program was so successful that they ended up creating Fannie Mae, and Fannie Mae's job was to purchase those loans and sell them on the open financial markets. And voila, it worked. We saw about a jump in 20 percent of in the rate of home ownership over time. From the government's perspective, this is great. When you own a home, you pay property taxes, which they love. It helps create jobs, helps drive community development. From the customer's perspective, it's also really, really helpful for them. It's a forced savings mechanism in an appreciating asset. And by the way, you can live inside this asset. No one lives inside the S&P 500. And while this was really great, there was this period that came on afterwards where we actually just saw the rate of home ownership stagnated. The 1990s had really high interest rates, and it meant that no one wanted to pay, you know, 20% interest rate on a 30-year fixed-rate mortgage. So the government said, "Hey, we did this once before. Let's try doing it again." They lowered underwriting requirements and started doing subprime lending, and they got the impact they want, which is homeownership increased. 
However, we ultimately know the impact of this was that we lent out to some consumers who were not creditworthy, and it led to a global housing-led recession. Since then, the rate of home ownership has stayed roughly flat. It would have been one thing if this, this decline in home ownership impacted everyone consistently, but it disproportionately impacted two groups. Millennials, who are those that are 25 to 35 years old, and first-time home buyers. So let's dig into to what we saw there. So this chart is the rate of home ownership on a constant age basis. And what you can see is that millennials today have a home ownership rate of about 37%. If we look also at first-time home buyers, this is the percent of offers that are coming from first-time home buyers. First-time home buyers used to be about 50% of the offers that got put out. Today, it's only about a third. Even more depressing is when first-time home buyers do put offers on their house, 76% of the time they have to put less than the recommended 20% down payment. And all of this is happening despite the fact that we're at the lowest 30-year fixed mortgage rate in history. So the government is fundamentally trying to drive up home ownership, but something's just not working. And so while I'd love to give you the perfect answer, like all really challenging questions, there seem to be a confluence of things that are influencing this. I've broken it down into what I think are the three key factors, and I'm going to take you through all of them. First one being a lack of affordable housing, second one being tightening underwriting requirements, and third one being millennials are just a little bit more financially complex than past generations. So let's start with affordable housing. So what this chart shows is the percent decline in number of for sale units from 2013 to 2019. And across the board, we've had a decline in the amount of inventory for sale. So if you're ever like, I don't feel like there are a ton of homes, yeah, you're not imagining that, that's, that's pretty real. Um, but if you look at the decline in the $150,000 price tier, you can see that the decline was almost 35%, which was greater than the decline we saw in $300,000 homes and $500,000 homes. Another way to show this chart is just the percent growth in the median home price. The median home price has grown by 120% since 1997. A higher median home price means that in absolute dollars, you're going to have to put more money down. However, it's really hard to put more money down when wages have roughly stayed flat. You're asking the American consumer to save up more money. The second reason has been tightening underwriting requirements. We've gone from having a 690 average FICO for mortgages up to about a 740 average FICO today. While this maybe doesn't seem like a tremendous jump, it actually cuts out about 20% of US consumers, so it had a pretty big impact. The third reason is millennials are just more financially complex than past generations. As an example of this, they're coming out of school saddled with more student debt than ever before. When you have more student debt, that means something called your DTI, or your debt-to-income ratio, is now higher. If your debt-to-income ratio is higher, that means you can only afford cheaper homes. But as I just showed you three slides ago, there really aren't a lot of affordable housing. So you're kind of stuck in this like catch-22 of there aren't homes that you can buy, even if you were set up in the right position to do so. In order to understand this problem better, I went back to the underwriting requirements from 1940s, and this is actually a screenshot of those underwriting requirements. I found that those underwriting requirements are fundamentally the same requirements that we have today. I personally applied for a mortgage last week. I applied to three different banks, and I got rejected from all three banks. I was told that as a founder, my current income was too low to support a mortgage. So first of all, you're welcome, Andreessen Horowitz. I'm keeping our burn rate nice and low. Yeah, but this is the same problem that we're seeing for the Uber driver who has 1099 income that we're also seeing for the you know, physician who just graduated med school with hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. We're all in the same boat. I truly believe that we need to fundamentally rethink how we provide access to homeownership. This, that is the past. The future and the fix is going to look quite a bit different. So the way you tackle what seems like a tremendous problem is generally to break it down into smaller pieces, which is exactly what the industry has done. On the right side of the screen, you can see folks who have attempted to provide a solution for people who can get a mortgage by creating more liquidity in the market. On the left side of the screen, you could see those who've gone after uh, consumers who haven't been able to get a mortgage, and, and Divi falls into this category. 
So at Divi, our goal is to really help create a stair step in between renting and owning a home. We believe that the industry today is very binary. You either rent a home or you dive into the deep end and get a mortgage. There is no in between. What Divi provides is something truly unique, which is access to the home you want today while not having to take on the financial risk of a mortgage, but we still give you upside in the property. I'm going to go through in a couple of slides exactly how this works. So today, we're operating in six geos, Tampa, Dallas, St. Louis, Memphis, Cleveland, and Atlanta. We're squarely a product for middle America, and we're really proud of that. Um, a lot of what we focus on is how do we educate the consumer? How do we talk to a consumer who's only known that the option that they've had historically is a mortgage? And now we are having these fundamentally new options that are available. The way that Divi works is we let you pick out a home. When you pick it out, Divi buys it on your behalf. You put down 2% at closing. We keep a, a synthetic equity account where we show you own 2%, Divi owns 98%. That first month that you move into the house, we auto pull your rent just like you would pay anywhere else, but we actually parse that payment. So we parse it into an equity component and a rent component. Rent is how we make profit. The equity component goes towards building up your ownership in the home piece by piece. So you go from 2% when you start off to 2.2% the first month, to 2.4% the next month, to 2.6% ownership the next month. We'd let you build up to 10% over the course of three years. At the end of three years, anywhere along the way, you can always buy out the house from us if you'd like. Additionally, if you want to walk away, you can and we'll cash you out for your percent ownership in the house. I think the key with Divi is that we take renters and we fundamentally make them feel like homeowners. And the result of this is better business returns. So what this chart shows you on the left-hand side is our rent yield versus public single-family REIT. And rent yield is just rent divided by the purchase price of the house. You can see that we get more rent per home on sort of a, a constant purchase price basis versus any of the public REITs. Additionally, when your renters think and act like homeowners, it means you have lower vacancy, lower turnover, and as a result, lower maintenance cost per home. Everything I've shared with you so far has been about what we've built to date. I also think that the future looks really exciting. So what is the future experience that we hope to do with Divi? It's not just a stair step in between renting and owning, but it's this complete path towards homeownership. What that looks and feels like is not only do you go pick out the home that you want and Divi buys it on your behalf, but before you move in, you get an email from us that says, hey, do you want cable and internet set up for you? How about a landscaping package? How about renter's insurance? Would any of that be helpful? And then when you move into the house and it gets used to you, and the inevitable happens, which if anyone owns a home here, you know it, where a pipe bursts and water's leaking from your ceiling, Divi's there to cover those maintenance costs for you and help you through it. And then ultimately, when you're ready to get the home and Divi underwrites you or is able to underwrite you for a mortgage, we'll send you a DocuSign that says, hey, here's your Divi mortgage. If you want to own this home, you can own it. If you don't want to own the home and you want the flexibility of renting, you can continue to do so as well. That, to us, from a first principles perspective, is the way the industry should work. I often come back to this idea that Divi customers truly act and feel like a homeowner despite them being a renter, and I always try to figure out why. I think it goes right back to what I had said earlier about Uber and Airbnb. Divi provides a fundamentally unique experience. We give you access to the home you want today without taking on the risk of a mortgage, but still give you upside in the, in the investment of the property. The traction that Divi and others have seen is proof that the real estate revolution has begun. Consumers are now going to get the home they want, when they want, and be set up on a better path towards home ownership. Thank you for your time. Have a great afternoon.